Good afternoon. I'm Prabhat Hajela, Provost at Rensselaer, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 17th Annual President's Commencement Colloquy. The Commencement Colloquy was established by President Jackson in 2003 to provide a forum for the Rensselaer community to gather on the eve of commencement for a dialogue with our honorands. Please join me in welcoming the host for today's colloquy, the 18th President of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. and welcome everyone to this beautiful Curtis R. Priam Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center for the great tradition we refer to as the President's Commencement Colloquy. And I want to welcome especially uh, any members of the great class of 2019 and their families and friends. <laughs> In both education and research, we focus at Rensselaer on the greatest of global challenges. And these include what you've heard me talk about before, food, water, and energy security for a global population that is likely to reach 8.6 billion in little over a decade, while at the same time mitigating and adapting to climate change, creating sustainable infrastructure, the intelligent allocation of valuable natural resources, national and global security in an often unstable world, and combating disease and improving human health around the world. In other words, at Rensselaer, we take on the hard problems to ensure that our work has the greatest possible impact and that our students learn at the very frontiers of human understanding so that they can push those frontiers outwards. Today, we have three distinguished leaders who will receive honorary degrees tomorrow, all of whom have taken direct aim at the greatest of challenges with the goal of improving lives at scale. With them, we will consider the health of the planet, leadership for local care and global impact, and the many ways that people of their leadership and focus can indeed improve lives and change the world. Please allow me now to introduce our guests. Our first honoran is a lawyer by training who has been president and chief executive officer of the Albany Medical Center since 1995, the only academic health sciences center in northeastern New York, and the region's only provider of tertiary patient care medical education, and biomedical research. In this capacity, he oversees Albany Medical Center Hospital, as well as Albany Medical College, one of the nation's oldest medical schools, founded in 1839, and a longtime partner of Rensselaer in education and research. From 1994 to 2006, he served as chairman of the board of directors of Albany Medical Center. During his tenure, he spearheaded Albany Medical Center affiliations with Columbia Memorial Health and Saratoga Hospital, and is directing the most ambitious expansion on the campus in its history. Construction recently was completed on a $52 million pediatric emergency department, the only one of its kind in the region. A native of Albany, he serves on the capital region Economic Development Council, which he chaired from 2012 to 2017, and on the boards of the Center for Economic Growth, the College of St. Rose, and Park Playhouse. Among many honors, he was named Citizen Laureate by the University at Albany in 2013. Formerly with the Albany law firm of Hiscock and Barclay, he is a graduate cum laude of the University of Notre Dame Law School and a graduate summa cum laude of Siena College. It is a great honor to welcome my great colleague and friend, Mr. James J. Barbara Esquire.
Our next honoran, a physician and epidemiologist by training, is president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, one of the nation's largest community foundations, which leads and inspires philanthropic efforts that improve the quality of life in the greater Chicago region. Previously, she was CEO of the McKinsey Social Initiative, a nonprofit that builds partnerships for social impact. For almost a decade, she most recently was president and CEO of CARE, a leading international humanitarian organization that works in over 90 countries and reaches tens of millions of people a year, fighting poverty and addressing emergencies caused by both natural disasters and conflict. Previously, she spent 20 years with the Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention, working primarily on HIV AIDS. She was appointed the first director of the National Center for HIV Sexually Transmitted Diseases and Tuberculosis Prevention, and achieved the rank of Rear Admiral and Assistant Surgeon General in the United States Public Health Service. She also worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, directing programs on HIV AIDS and other global health issues. Named one of Forbes Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women, she has published many papers and articles on global and domestic public health issues, poverty alleviation, gender equality, and social justice. Among many professional affiliations, she is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and the Council on Foreign Relations, and serves on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. She earned a BA in psychology at Barnard College, an MD at the University of Pennsylvania, and a Master's of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Helene Gale. Our final honoran and commencement speaker, a theoretical physicist and aerospace engineer by training, and an expert in energy and climate policy, was President Barack Obama's science advisor and the Senate confirmed director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy from January 2009 until January 2017. In this role, he served as co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAST, where I had the great pleasure of serving alongside him for six years. He also served as a member of PCAST from 1994 to 2001 during the administration of President Bill Clinton. From 1996 through 2008, he was the Teresa and John Heinz Professor of Environmental Policy in the Kennedy School of Government and Professor of Environmental Science and Policy in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University, positions he resumed in 2017. In 1995, our honoran gave the Nobel Peace Prize acceptance lecture on behalf of the Pukwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, an organization that brings together scientists and public figures to work for arms reduction, where he served in leadership positions from 1983 to 1997. From 1973 to 1996, he was on the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley, where he co-founded and co-led the Interdisciplinary Graduate Degree Program in Energy and Resources. His many awards include one of the first MacArthur Foundation Prize Fellowships, and last year, the Moynihan Prize for Leading Policymakers 
in the American Academy of Political and Social Science, the first time the prize had been awarded to a natural scientist. He has been elected a member of leading professional societies around the world that include the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Royal Society of the U.K. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and a PhD from Stanford University in aerospace engineering and theoretical plasma physics. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable John Holdren. Thank you. We're going to take this picture. Thank you. Please. So let us begin. The title of our colloquy today, Health of the Planet, Leadership for Local Care and Global Impact, arises from the careers of all three, all three of your biographies, and your commitment to enhancing human well-being on a large scale. So let me begin with you, Dr. Holton. Uh, you have been asserting throughout your career that human well-being rests on three legs the economic, the socio-political, and the environmental, all of which are interconnected. In other words, if we degrade the earth and its essential systems, we destroy the conditions for prosperity. So why do you think decades after the science, many believe, have, has been settled, does the United States still lack the national will to combat climate change? Well, first of all, President Jackson, thank you very much for that generous introduction. The mystery to which you refer is how it can be decades after we had the scientific understanding needed to lay out a strategy to address global climate change, we still, as a nation, have not done so. In the Obama administration, we did produce, as you know, with the help of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, on which you sat, a climate action plan which was as comprehensive as we could make it without the expectation of any support from Congress. The lack of expected support from Congress on climate change is really due to the politicization of the climate change issue, which started in the 1990s when Al Gore, who was Mr. Climate Change, was the Vice President of the United States and was obviously going to be the candidate in 2000, and previously bipartisan approaches in the Congress to climate change, which started actually in 1988, evaporated as the Republicans concluded that their opponent in the 2000 election was going to run on climate change, and so they would run against it. That was brought into being in part by long-standing denial of the reality of the climate change issue by a number of the major oil companies and by a small number of scientists who argued that the changes were natural or that even if they were caused by humans, they would not cause much harm or that there was so much uncertainty that we should wait for more information before spending society's resources to address the challenge. All of that was made possible in part by the characteristics of the climate change problem, which include that it happens relatively slowly until, of course, you reach a tipping point and something starts to happen rapidly. And in addition, it has the characteristics that at any given moment, you're only experiencing a part of the impact to which you're already committed from the gases you've added to the atmosphere. All of those characteristics together and the tendency of society to respond best to crises uh, when there are bodies in the street that can be attributed to the problem have led us into this situation where we are way behind the curve in responding. So Dr. Gale, let me carry on a bit here. You know, two professors at Stanford University recently published a study that 
found that anthropogenically driven climate change had exacerbated global inequality by about 25% over the last 50 years on a per capita GDP basis, decreasing the economic output, especially of hotter, poorer countries. Can you tell us some about the effects of global warming on the people you served at CARE? Yeah, and let me add my thanks um, to being here today, and thank you for, your, for that kind introduction. It's great to be with my uh, fellow honorands um, here at this colloquial uh, <clears throat> and at this incredible um, institution. So, you said the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> wearing red. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, when I was at CARE, one of the biggest threats that we had to the issue of trying to combat global poverty was climate change and, the, and what it was doing to the poorest uh, people around the world. And, you know, like so many other things that we face in this world, um, those who have the least are often those who are the most impacted. And so, you know, if you looked at anything from desertification to increase uh, cyclones and flooding. It was people in poor countries that were bearing the brunt uh, of something that primarily industrialized nations created. Um, and it was having a huge impact, and particularly um, on women and children in countries where we were. So a lot of our work went into adaptation. You know, countries who uh, are emitting the um, dangerous gases and, and excess CO2, et cetera, are really focused a lot on mitigation. How do you make sure that we're not continuing to um, drive the increases because of what we're doing as industrialized nations? In poor countries, we worked a lot on how do you make sure that people who are affected by the impact are adapting and that their cir circumstances weren't getting worse. So we worked a lot with coastal areas, for instance, looking at you know, are there ways in which coastal communities could change their life to adapt to the reality of climate change? People who were facing increased drought and famine, how do you look at crops that were being grown and looking at, um, you know, more drought-resistant seeds and helping to produce, um, to reduce the impact that people were having? But as an example, you know, we worked a lot with poor people and their livelihoods. And in some of the coastal areas where there was more flooding also were areas where people uh, raised chicken as, as a living. And you know, just a simple example, we helped communities who were raising chickens switch to ducks because the ducks float. <laughs> and we, you know, so you know, th these are sometimes simple example, but, but I think it shows that even in the face of some of these incredible challenges, there are ways of working with communities to try to adapt to it while the rest of us ought to be thinking about how do we mitigate it so we don't continue to put the, the burden of climate change on the people who can withstand it the least. You know, talking about mitigation, uh, John, this is something I thought I would ask you. I'm gonna call you John from now on. That's fine. Um, isn't it true that the military is concerned about climate change? and its effect on how it deploys uh, our forces around the globe? Absolutely, it's true. The military has actually, among federal agencies, been a leader in addressing climate change and recognizing the threats that it poses to their missions, and including recognizing the ways that it complicates their missions uh, by expanding them. For example, we now have uh, in the world the phenomenon of environmental refugees, of people leaving their uh, home regions or their home countries because the environmental conditions have changed as a result of climate change in ways that make it impossible to continue to prosper in those original locations. And those flows of refugees are overwhelming uh, the capacity of receiving countries or the willingness of receiving countries to accept them. They are causing increasing political stresses, and those stresses, uh, as recognized by the Pentagon, can lead to conflict. They can lead to governmental collapse. Uh, they can lead to civil war. And uh, so the military has, uh, over the years, 
uh, over the decades really been publishing studies that said this is a big problem, we have to address it, we have to prepare for it, and we have to reduce our own contributions to it. To the credit of the Pentagon, they have been exploring the use of sustainably grown biofuels to power jet aircraft and, uh, and, and military vessels, naval vessels. They have been working to expand the deployment of renewable energy resources to fund their bases and so on. Uh, I only wish that the forward-leaning attitude of the military uh, had propagated more effectively and more permanently into some of the other branches of government, mm. including particularly the White House. <laughs> so when, when we think about societal well-being, uh, a lot of the discussion, particularly in this country, devolves around uh, health care. And, and just as there are divides uh, among and between societies, there can be the differences, obviously, within societies, including in the United States. Now, it's, it's true that even, and you can tell me if you agree, that even with the Affordable Care Act, the tens of millions of people cannot afford health insurance. And the American Hospital Association uh, has said it opposes Medicare for all, and I know it's in the political arena. But uh, Mr. Barber, Jim, you've been on the ground here, and, and you've been saying for more than a decade that the United States has to move to a single-payer uh, health care system. You know, why do you believe this is the right answer? And what do you, have you seen in your decades of leadership at the... Uh, uh, Albany Medical Center that reinforces that as you serve the community here in the greater capital region and frankly upstate New York. Certainly. Um, before I answer that, Dr. Jackson, let me complete the trio by thanking you for uh, your leadership, for your invitation here. Uh, I, I'm proud to be a, a, among these very distinguished guests. Um, your opening premise was that perhaps the Affordable Care Act didn't quite do uh, everything that some of us may have wanted it to do, and that's certainly true. Um, but I do think it was an important, albeit modest, attempt to move in the right direction toward universal health care coverage. To answer the question specifically about a single-payer system, and, and I'm careful these days not to use Medicare for all, and we can go into that uh, later if you want to. Um, I, would give you, I would give you two answers why I think we will get there uh, whenever. Uh, the first is purely financial. Last year, the United States spent in all of health care $3.6 trillion, achingly close to 20% of the gross domestic product of the United States. I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know when a single service uh, occupies so much of the GDP that it threatens the entire economy of the United States. But I think we are well on our way toward challenging that. Um, so, you know, is 20% uh, is not doing it? Is 25% the number? Is 30% the number? I don't know. But there is a number out there. Uh, and equally what worries me about getting toward that number is that we're speeding toward it. So medical inflation in the United States last year was almost 6%, while general inflation was approximately 2%. And that is happening year after year, with very few exceptions. Um, so we continue to, to occupy more and more uh, of the general economy of the United States. The, the, the second answer I'd give you is, is more societal and perhaps, for me, more philosophic. Uh, I don't know how the wealthiest nation in the history of the world can tell its citizens that many of them, many of us, will not be able to access, in an important way, the healthcare system of America. There was a very important study uh, that was published from Harvard just 10 years ago, in 2009, which suggested, and at the time, the un, it was before Obamacare, at the time, the uninsured rate in the United States was about 45 million people. And it suggested, quite authoritatively, it was using data from the CDC, that uh, because 45 million people were uninsured that year, 
about 45,000 would die purely because they did not have health insurance. Now that's a completely, I mean, 1,000 is unacceptable to me, but 45,000 is grossly unacceptable. I, I think with the, with the uninsured rate now being down in the high 20 millions, about 28 million, we, we could probably use the same formula that that study did and say <laughs> about 28,000 will die this year because they have no health insurance. It's just, uh, it, it, it's not something in conscience I think we can live with, uh, and, and it's something we absolutely have to fix. And I, and I would conclude, uh, Dr. Jackson, by saying, and I'd ask everyone to remember, that just because you don't have health insurance does not mean you're not getting some kind of health care. What it usually means is that you're getting it, but you're getting it too late, so that what we might have been able to prevent uh, way back earlier in the onset of illness, we no longer can prevent or it costs so much more to do it. And, and so many of these people are getting that health care in the first instance in the most expensive venue that we have to offer an emergency room. Can I just add to that to say, you know, it, it's why, your last point, it's why we spend more on yes. health care than any yes. industrialized Absolutely. nation and get the worst results. And get the worst results, right. Well, you know, it's interesting because a lot of our discussion about health care has taken place within an economic frame. But Dr. Holdren, uh, you know, when you were leading, uh, you know, PCAST and with, you were the president's science advisor, uh, PCAST, uh, you know, assisted with the development of reports to President Obama that assessed the possibility of using various technologies, including information technology, to improve the American healthcare system, and of using concepts from systems engineering. Indeed. Uh, including the development of the nation's health data infrastructure, as well as some economic things of aligning incentives with outcomes. And now Amazon is part of a new healthcare venture called Haven. Uh, which was created, they say, out of frustration with the high cost and low quality of the health care of its employees. Now, is it possible, uh, or how possible, is it that the health care system will be transformed by the technology sector or technology itself, realizing that, of course, there's not just one narrow bullet, but, but I thought it would be interesting for people to hear about some of the thoughts of PCAST and of yourself in this regard. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, the PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, actually did five or six yes, different right. studies, which exactly. you've, uh, you've mentioned a number of them. It studied responsiveness to influenza epidemics and how to improve that responsiveness. It studied uh, antibiotic resistance and how to combat antibiotic resistance. It studied, as you noted, uh, information technology to improve health care. It studied systems engineering to improve health care. And I think what all of those studies uh, concluded is that it is possible to do better. Not that technology by itself is going to fix it, but the health care system with assistance from technology can certainly be made more efficient. It can certainly be made to deliver uh, better results on the whole for lower costs. And uh, certainly one of the most appealing propositions in there is that information technology, electronic health records, understanding the characteristics of individual patients and individual groups of patients with particular ailments with a precision that would enable their therapies to be tailored more precisely to the patient's characteristics and to the disease's characteristics all sounds very promising. But there are big obstacles. Uh, electronic health care records are on a multiplicity of systems that are incompatible with each other. And physicians often complain that the amount of time they spend struggling with the electronic health record system is taking away from their capacity to actually deal with patients. So there are big hurdles still to be overcome before this potential can be realized. But it is not something on which we ought to give up. As Jim has pointed out, things are heading in an ultimately unsustainable direction. Uh, I do not believe that we can afford to spend 30% of our GDP on health care. I think we're already suffering uh, consequences of lost opportunities in other domains at 20%. And so we should be redoubling our efforts to take advantage of the opportunities in applying systems engineering, in applying information technology, in uh, addressing in innovative ways 
the challenge of providing better health care for all at lower costs. So, Mr. Barber, then, I mean, you have a unique lens. I mean, what role do you see? I mean, Amazon represents the tech sector. Do you, what role do you see for the tech sector or more broadly technology itself, you know, in healthcare? And, and what do you think our priorities need to be in terms of biomedical spending? Well, I, I clearly agree with John. Technology has an important, maybe a critically important role to play in all of this. Um, I, I'll go back and I'll do this very quickly to a uh, 2000, year 2000 report from the um, Institute of Medicine. Uh, it was called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And in it, it predicted that no matter what we did to try to improve quality inside the current healthcare system, and I'm going to put system in quotes, we would not be able to do it because there is no system. It's broken. It, it, if there ever was one. It's, it's, it's a loose amalgam. It, it, the the allergy, analogy that I always use, it's, it's, it's balkanized. It's like the Balkans before World War I. Um, the only way we can fix it is by having evidence-based medicine supported by sophisticated information systems, to the technology point. Um, the, the great um, frustration that I have had uh, is that these systems are fabulously expensive. Um, and by and large, they do not live up to their promises. Um, so we, at Albany Medical Center, we sit on top of an enormous reservoir of data, uh, all of which, which, or most of which, has, has not been organized in any uh, meaningful way so that it can become predictive, so that it can help us with diagnoses. We still look today, and this very day, for uh, an information system, an electronic health record, that will help us do that, and then will help us in real time with real life patients. That system is not out there yet, in my opinion. There are only two major corporations in the United States right now that, of that offer these systems. We've looked at both of them. Both of them have serious flaws, and as long as they do, we are unwilling to spend 200 or more million dollars to buy one of them. So yes, technology will absolutely help. I do think it's, it's, it's an important answer, but it's not the answer today yet. Do you think that what uh, Amazon is setting out to do, I think it's with Berkshire Hathaway, mm -hmm. uh, has a kernel of a solution in it that they have the deep pockets that they can figure out this pathway? for the use of uh, technology uh, uh, you know, uh, and per, getting this interoperability that John talked about a minute ago, Dr. Holdren? Perhaps. I mean, we've seen Amazon do other very interesting things in the business world. Uh, what I know from having been in my position for almost 25 years now is that while medicine is a business, which is to say you can't sustain it unless you have a margin, it's very different from the commercial entrepreneurial businesses. And at, at the center of all of medicine are physicians. Without the doctors, you really don't have meaningful, critical health care. And if the docs don't buy in to what you're trying to do in terms of technology, it's not going to work. You know, Dr. Gale, uh, you spent some time at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And obviously, given where the CDC sits, um, you know, it has mounds and mounds of, of data. How do we cross these divides to kind of use uh, data in, in the most useful way and, and bring it into a clinical setting, but then how does it play into a, a global setting? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, as everybody has mentioned, you know, obviously data has a huge role. And I think um, that data can enable a lot of the kinds of outcomes that we want. But I think data in the absence of a system, which is you know, what we've all talked about, is not going to get there. And so even the, um, the experiment that Amazon and others are doing with trying to create this island of a perfect health solution, you know, maybe they will. But I think without the broader will to actually think about what does it take to create a real system, um, you know, one pilot activity alone is not going to do it. It may help us understand how you build some of the, some of the, the data that help. 
but clearly, you know, there's, there's no question. Information technology has revolutionized everything we do. And it could revolutionize what we do in health. But I also think that, you know, when we, you know from where I sit and we think about health, medical care is just a piece of health. And part of what we need to do is to create systems that link to social services, that uh, make sure that there are grocery stores so that people can have adequate nutrition, make sure that there's public safety. And you know, so we've got to build systems more broadly. And when we think about what does it take not just to have great health care, but actually to have good health outcomes, then we start talking about the social determinants of health and how do you think about all the things that actually impact people's health that actually contribute a lot more than health care. And when you look at what, what part of health care contributes to better health outcomes, it actually isn't the largest contributor to better health outcomes. It's all of these other things that have to do with the environment that people grow up in, uh, all of the social and economic factors that influence people's lives. So I think we have to think about this issue of health more holistically, making sure that we have a health system that is core to it, but then thinking about what else does it take to actually improve health status. Well, when you were uh, leading uh, care, you particularly were focused on the societal causes of disease around the globe. And uh, at the same time here, uh, the, in your current role, the Chicago Community Trust has made addressing economic inequities, uh, including uh, the wealth gap between uh, white households and minority households, uh, one of your first priorities. And so uh, two questions that I would have for you. One, are the roots of uh, you know, poverty and how it affects health the same uh, globally as it is in the U.S. And, and secondly, we know that this wealth gap has its historical roots in certain what were really discriminatory federal policies and programs that made it difficult for certain groups, including African Americans, to get mortgages, to have homes, to create wealth. How do all these things play off of each other? Yeah, <laughs> big questions. Well, they, but, they but, you yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, I would start by saying, you know, part of why I do what I do is that as a physician um, that went into public health, you know, I started realizing more and more that while I could continue to focus on things that were in the health toolkit, if you will, um, and make a difference, that ultimately, if you get at the root cause of, of these issues, so much of it is driven by economic inequity. And so, you know, both here in the United States as well as globally, you know, we know that we have systems that don't work equally for all people. And then if we don't address those broader systems, whether it's globally or domestically, that we can continue to put band-aids, um, you know, whether they are health band-aids or economic band-aids on things, but that we're not really going to make a difference. And I think globally there's a lot of reasons. You know, for we're seeing now on the global stage that poverty probably is bimodal, if you will. There are there are countries who were traditionally poor uh, because of you know, a lot of factors, whether it's colonialization, uh, et cetera, that have that started out further behind that are now having a real economic re re renaissance and moving forward because better governance better economic policies, et cetera. But then you have another portion of countries that are kind of mired in poverty because of poor governance, co conflict, um, climate change, so natural as well as, uh, as man-made disasters. And those are countries where it, it is much more difficult to make a difference. And I think we see some of those same things here in this country, that there are com communities that come to the United States, have the opportunity to get an economic leg up, and then there are populations for whom there have been specific policies that have made it very difficult to get a foothold and, um, and, make it, and, and have equal economic opportunity. And it's why we made this issue of the racial wealth gap our highest organizational priority, because we recognize that you know if you have two-thirds of your population unable to participate in the economy, it's not just hurting them, it's hurting everybody. 
and that if we didn't figure out a way to look at some of these persistent issues, and a lot of them, again, are policy issues, that we wouldn't be able to make a difference. And in this country, uh, one of the best books I've read in a long time is called The Color of Law, that really lays out the kind of discriminatory policies that you talked about that, that very specifically limited the ability for African Americans to own homes. We know that home ownership is one of the ways in which most families begin to accumulate wealth and are able to hand that wealth down and have intergenerational transfer of wealth. Well, if you don't have that initial ability to have equity that allows you to have that economic foothold, and if you have intentional policies that keep you out of that, um, it's real hard to, to move forward. So, you know, it's a big issue, but one that I think that, uh, you know, if, if you don't get started somewhere, you'll never be able to make that difference. Yeah, just a parenthetical remark. Mo many people don't realize that when the GI Bill was promulgated, it was explicitly structured in a way that uh, to leave uh, African American veterans out in terms of benefits for toward home ownership and higher education. And so that set back a whole generation or more of folks. People also don't realize that when Social Security came into being, it was explicitly excluded, excluding agricultural and domestic workers. And 80% of them at the time were African American. So again, uh, these things uh, persist over generations. Now, Jim, we've talked about some of those uh, economic inequities, but one thing here that you've done in the capital region is that you've gone beyond the expansion of the medical center to actually have impact in the neighborhoods uh, around the center and on people who live in the greater Albany area because you have partnered with others to give an explicit leg up to young people born in lower socioeconomic conditions while at the same time you've been leading economic development efforts in the Crapola region. And so how do all of these efforts interlink and how do you think they link to some of these larger uh, national and global issues that we've been talking about of human well-being? I, uh, I, I felt myself very privileged when um, I was chosen to be the CEO of Albany Medical Center all those many years ago. And, and as I got more comfortable in the job, and that took me a few years, I understood that the medical center could and of right ought to operate on a number of different levels. The first clearly was as the deliverer of healthcare, no question about that. So we had to work very hard on uh, expanding the programs that we offered uh, and then trying to assure to the extent humanly possible and medically possible that each one of those programs was excellent. The quality was excellent. And I think over the 24 years that I've been there, we, we've come close to achieving that. The second thing that I understood was that um, at the time, and certainly today, uh, the medical center was one of the largest employers uh, in the region. It is now the largest private employer in the region. We, we employ uh, just over 13,000 people from all walks of life. Um, and as an employer, uh, it was critical that we take a look at the composition of our city, the city of Albany, of, of our region, uh, and understand what was going on there and what the needs were uh, for those people for employment. When I first began, we had very few immigrants coming into the region. Now we are, in my opinion, blessed with having many, many immigrants. Um, many of them do not speak English. Um, uh, many of them just need a, a leg up. Uh, they need a, a, a first job. And, and so we have tried, and I think we've succeeded, in doing all of that. Um, and, and then giving them um, um, a, a, a route inside the medical center to advance. So a clinician, um, employer. Uh, the third was as a neighbor. Um, as with most many academic medical centers, we started a long time ago, 1839, I think you said in your introduction. Uh, and that means that we sit in a part of the city that had, over time, 
uh, devolved. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I became CEO, it, we sat in a very high crime area. And so one of my goals was to take the neighborhoods immediately surrounding ours and, and to improve them. Um, and there we were fortunate to have private partners who agreed with that, uh, with that vision. Uh, and so we did, one block at a time, whole city blocks though, uh, begin to change the uh, complexion, the complexion uh, of the immediately surrounding neighborhood. That had a ripple effect, and I'm, I'm still hoping that it will have an additional ripple effect so that other um, uh, investors uh, who have nothing to do with the medical center or our properties will come in and do the same thing, and that's happening in the city. And then the fourth thing was, and this may sound a, a little bit curious because we're a not-for-profit, uh, I also thought we had an obligation as something of a philanthropist. We don't have Fortune 500 companies in this region. Uh, and, and when I tell you that a not-for-profit is the largest employer, that means something. And it means that we have to look into our communities and find those other small, fledgling, struggling uh, organizations, whether they be not-for-profit, and most of them are, or for-profit, that need a leg up, need, a, need, need some help. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's the assistance of some, of some very able people whom we employ. Uh, so that they can begin to make life better for our communities. It's what Dr. Gale said, you know. Uh, poverty has many faces, um, and, and success has a few. But if you can step in as a large organization and begin to invest, then you can begin to experience that success. You know, it's interesting. Both of you have kind of talked about uh, things one could do to get at some of the systemic issues. At the same time, you know, I, I like to talk about what I call uh, intersecting vulnerabilities with cascading consequences. Right? And, and we've talked about uh, poverty and how it affects the health of the planet in the form of the human health. Yep. We've talked about uh, climate change and its impact in exacerbating poverty and even uh, force, forcing people to migrate. So, Dr. Holdren, have we gotten uh, to a point uh, with climate effects that, that we have to move beyond mitigation and adaptation towards geoengineering or trying to do large-scale manipulation of the climate? First of all, is it possible? And, and is that where we need to go? And if so, how do you get a global governance framework in that regard? So this, this is, as you know, <laughs> President Jackson, a... Uh, a huge issue. I mean, I would say, first of all, that we are, I think, coming to a tipping point in public support and political willingness to address climate change in a serious way, notwithstanding current inclinations uh, of, the, uh, of the present White House. Uh, what we are seeing that we weren't seeing uh, even 10 years ago, uh, and certainly not 20 years ago, in the way of symptoms, increases in the power of the strongest storms. Uh, more and heavier torrential downpours with associated flooding, not just all over the United States, but all over the world. Longer, drier droughts, longer, hotter heat waves, uh, longer, more intense allergy seasons, bigger, hotter wildfires, expanded geographic ranges of tropical disease vectors. Uh, all of this is now becoming so conspicuous, so obvious, and so damaging that I think we are at a tipping point where we will embrace serious measures to reduce emissions, mitigation. We will embrace serious measures for adaptation, preparedness, and resilience. And we will at least look at the so-called geoengineering measures. For example, uh, what is now called solar radiation management, trying to inject reflecting particles into the stratosphere to try to compensate for some of the heating from greenhouse gases by reflecting more of the incoming sunlight back into space. Nobody knows at this point whether there is an approach to solar radiation management or any other form of so-called geoengineering that is scalable, affordable, and doesn't have side effects that make the cure worse than the disease. But we have to look. 
we know that people will become desperate enough as these impacts grow that they will be reaching for any solution that appears to be promising. And if we have not studied the geoengineering possibilities so that we understand which ones have leverage, what their costs are, what their risks are, uh, we're going to be in a very bad position. People are going to grab for solutions, and some of them may turn out to be anti-improvements. Uh, there is no approach to geoengineering that has even been identified that can cope with all of the consequences of the additions of heat trapping gases that we've added to the atmosphere. Some of them could deal with some of the consequences to some extent, but again, we need to explore and understand the costs, the leverage, and the risks before we go forward. And you mentioned the problem of governance. Uh, this is a huge challenge. There are approaches to influencing the climate, such as injecting material into the stratosphere, such as injecting material into the oceans, that could be affordable by subnational groups. They could be affordable by small nations. They could be affordable by big companies. Amazon could afford to undertake solar radiation management at some scale. We need a governance strategy and a governance system for geoengineering that will prevent dangerous experimentation without adequate understanding. Do you think our given uh, extant uh, multinational organizations have any capability of uh, providing a governance framework? Well, that's almost a trick question. You promised, <laughs> you, you promised no trick question, surely, but, 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 but that one's getting close. Um, I, obviously, our international governance frameworks have fallen short in many respects, but they've also achieved quite a lot. Uh, they've achieved a lot in disease prevention and control uh, with the help of people like Dr. Gale. They have uh, achieved a fair amount in arms control and nonproliferation. There were people who, in 1960, thought that by 1970 there would be 50 countries with nuclear weapons. Uh, there aren't. There are still more than I would like, but there aren't 50. Uh, it's about 10. Uh, the Paris Agreement on climate change, although in my judgment it came 25 years late, was still an immense achievement to get 195 countries to make specific commitments specific to their own conditions to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and to revisit those commitments at five-year intervals with an eye to increased ambition and to monitor the emissions and the buildup in the atmosphere in a cooperative way and to provide assistance to countries in need from the richest countries so that they could afford the measures they need to take that Dr. Gale mentioned to protect themselves, to adapt. All of that was an extraordinary achievement. And I think it still has enormous potential. It's very unfortunate that President Trump decided to withdraw from that agreement on the grounds it would harm the US economy. And I will mention that before he withdrew, 600 American CEOs wrote him a letter begging him to stay in and saying that withdrawing will harm the American economy because there is going to be a big industry in providing the clean and efficient technologies and the approaches to adaptation, preparedness, and resilience that the world needs in affordable ways. And our businesses want to be in that game. We don't want to be left behind yeah, in that I, game. I was going to add, as you were saying that, it was, you know, it had come to my mind. I think one of the things that I feel somewhat hopeful in this whole arena is the way that businesses are starting to step up and how seriously businesses are starting to take their responsibility to the planet. And to, Absolutely. And, and, and part of it is because this generation is, is demanding it. You know, uh, this generation is demanding that companies take seriously their responsibility to the planet and to people. They want to work for companies that have a purpose and, and who are environmentally responsible. And I, you know, and I think we're now starting to see more commitment to it from major uh, international, multinational Ab corporations right. like you never did before. And absolutely so it's, it, right. it's, it's a sad statement in a way on our global governance that 
countries are no longer taking the lead, but Some somebody has, but somebody has to, and yeah. I, you know, and I think that it's it's good that companies are now <laughs> stepping up in a way that they never did before. So, so let's follow this along, and and going back to, uh, you know, scourges of to human health, looking at infectious diseases, and because it, it plays into this uh, question of what can <coughs> organizations do. So, so Dr. Gill. You know, at the CDC and at the Gates Foundation, when you were on the front lines of fighting uh, against HIV AIDS, both in the US and around the globe. And you know, the, U the UN AIDS organization recently declared, and I quote, that ending the AIDS epidemic in Africa is within reach, that's the quote. Now if that's true, this truly is a, a triumph of global public health joint efforts. So. What, in your view, were some of the key factors and key players that allowed uh, uh, the HIV scourge to be diffused? And, and what does it say about what we might do vis-a-vis -vis other emerging in infectious diseases? And it's interesting, as we were talking about climate change, I was reflecting that there are actually a lot of similarities to HIV AIDS. And you know, um, when HIV first started and was first discovered, there was a lot of denial, there was a lot of stigma, there was a lot of scientific misinformation. And in the same way as climate change, it's one of these you know, kind of long-term chronic diseases that by the time you realize you have a problem, it's almost too late. And it's really hard to get people to act because you know this is a virus that takes 10 or more years to actually um, reveal symptoms and so you know for so many years we here in the United States as well as people around the world uh, were very were very uh, much in denial about the importance of this as, as uh, a real problem but you know and it meant it cost us millions and billions of dollars that we could have saved had we you know taken uh, the right actions early on and not um, been in such incredible global denial about the disease. That said, I think once uh, people began to understand the impact, both health-wise as well as economically, um, and again, just as you were talking about the, the military, the military got very concerned about the destabilization impact of HIV. So all that to say, you know, I think people recognize, they recognize too late, but one of the things that made such a big difference in the HIV epidemic was leadership and people being able to start showing high level leadership. It meant that there were then dollars that came. Um, when I first headed the global HIV um, program at USAID, we had a budget of about $250 million. Now we spend uh, in the billions of dollars every year, but it took leadership, it took real commitment, and it also took people living with HIV getting very much in, in the struggle. And I think had we not had people with H living with HIV been so heroic in their efforts to call attention to this, we would still not be where we are today. And it is one of the wonderful um, stories of global solidarity when AIDS activists from this country started recognizing how important it was globally. They became champions for the global epidemic and, and became champions for being generous um, and led to the efforts where America did lead for many, many years in the fight against HIV AIDS globally. You know, one of the things that made a huge difference was the incredible um, breakthroughs in treatment. Um, 20 years ago, HIV was a death sentence. Now it's a long-term chronic disease that is manageable. Um, 10 years ago, we didn't think that it was possible to bring AIDS treatment to poor countries in Africa and Asia. Today, we think it is possible, and we've demonstrated that it can make a difference. That said, a certain amount of complacency is set in, yeah. and we are facing an inflection point where if the kind of commitment that we've seen in the last decade starts to erode, and it is eroding, um, you know, we may see a resurgence of this in ways that um, I think we'll all live to regret. So I think what happens, I mean, we do always run a risk when something becomes uh, more manageable of complacency, but nonetheless, there are still are lessons learned. Now, I know uh, Mr. Barbara, Albany Medical Center actually helped to turn AIDS from a death sentence into a, a chronic manageable condition by actually working with the CDC, 
on clinical trials of protease inhibitors. Um, and there was a great deal of discrimination uh, against AIDS patients in the early years. So, so what, why did Albany Med Medical Center decide to lead in this battle? Because no one else was doing it in upstate New York. Just that simple. The, uh, the first AIDS case, we didn't call it AIDS in the beginning, uh, was diagnosed in the spring of 1981. Um, and very rapidly thereafter, there were more and more cases, and, and doctors understood that we had this new, this new disease that no one had ever seen before. Um, as I said, it, it, it was being seen, and, and there were fledgling treatment programs. There really was no treatment. It was comfort care uh, in those early days um, in New York City. But there was nothing upstate. Um, the mission of the medical center has always been to care for anyone who needs care, irrespective of ability to pay. And so it was either in late 81 or early 82, but right at the very beginning of this crisis, that we opened uh, a section of our hospital to care for these patients. As I say, it was comfort care, it was nothing else. Um, but as time went by, and as um, some treatments began to look like they were promising, namely the, initially the four protease inhibitors, um, CDC recognized that we had such an early program uh, we had lots of experience with the, these patients, their disease, and the progression of their disease, that they thought that um, Albany Med was one of the few places, and there are others, in the United States that really deserved to work in clinical trials with all four simultaneously. Uh, long story short, and I'm not claiming any, you know, uh, I'm not claiming that, that we were the, uh, the only institution that solved it, but long story short, um, those drugs became later the, uh, the, the, the earliest uh, family of, of current drugs that was able to turn this disease from a death sentence into a chronic disease. Um, I will tell you from firsthand experience, because I, I, I was there, I was on the board at the time, uh, that even in board discussions, there was great worry uh, about what this would mean to other patients or what it would mean to, uh, to nurses and doctors. And maybe we should not be doing it for that reason. Uh, but the people who led the medical center at the time withstood all of that pressure. Uh, and we, uh, we developed the program, we maintained the program, and we helped develop those protease inhibitors. Dr. Gill, is it true that some of your colleagues, or at least some of them at the CDC, tried to dissuade you from, <laughs> from your work on HIV? Yeah, well, when I first came to CDC, um, you know, it was early in the AIDS epidemic, and, you know, I was in this uh, epidemi epidemiologic training program, and you get to select where you want to go and work, and I, you know, had heard about HIV, thought it would be an interesting place to um, learn. It was a new disease, scientifically interesting. Um, but so many people said, you know, stay away from AIDS. You know, it's just this kind of political disease, and you know, it's not going to really be that important of a public health issue anyway. Go do something that has a real important public health impact. Um, obviously, I didn't pay attention, and it became really the defining public health issue of, of our day. Well, there's a, a kind of emerging uh, public health issue. Dr. Holdren, you referred to in your earlier remarks, and that has to do with the effect of, of climate change on the, the spread of uh, infectious diseases. Can you want to elaborate a little bit more about that, and, 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 and what other health risks are there? Sure. I mean, there's a whole panoply of health risks, and these, like many of the risks of climate change, are becoming better documented uh, in the last several years than they had been 10 or 20 years ago. One. Uh, that I mentioned already is as the, the climate in general warms, the geographic range of the vectors of some of the tropical diseases expand. So you've got malaria, you've got dengue, you've got Zika, uh, you've got um, a number of others that are spreading in geographic range. You also have changes uh, that actually influence the rate of activity of the vectors uh, for example, how often mosquitoes bite changes uh, with temperature. And um, in addition, I mentioned uh, longer, more intense allergy seasons. 
One uh, uh, very serious problem which was not understood at all 20 years ago is the way in which climate change affects air pollution episodes with conventional air pollutions. Carbon dioxide is not per se toxic. The problem with carbon dioxide is that it's changing the climate. But the changes in climate are increasing the concentrations of ozone, of sulfur oxides, of fine particulates, uh, because of changes in the inversion structure of the atmosphere. And so we are seeing more severe air pollution episodes than would be occurring in the absence of climate change. This is obviously uh, a healthcare issue. So there are many different dimensions. Of course, powerful storms and floods are health issues. They, <laughs> they kill people, they injure people, uh, and they create conditions. For example, the overflow of sewage treatment plants mm -hmm. uh, spreading disease because of torrential downpours and intense flooding. It's really uh, a panoply of impacts. Uh, my colleague, uh, Gina McCarthy, the former head of the Environmental Protection Agency, is now running a program in the Harvard School of Public Health focused entirely on health impacts of climate change. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, potent set of impacts, but it's also uh, a, a very effective way to get the public's attention because whatever else the public cares about, they care about the economy, they care about personal security, they care about their health. Uh, and, and when it becomes apparent that climate change is harming people's health, the degree of enthusiasm for doing something about it increases. That's one of the reasons uh, that Gina McCarthy is, is, is doing that work and, and a lot of other people are, uh, are doing that work. You know, it's interesting, um, and, and, and uh, Mr. Barber, I must say you've been a, a great friend to, well, so many uh, communities here, but obviously Rensselaer when we've had, you know, emergent uh, medical issues, because uh, a university is an interesting uh, situation because we, it's like a small town, and we have uh, a, a lot of people, mainly young people, living in close proximity. And so uh, the spread of things can be easier. <laughs> and uh, there are some lessons that, and unfortunate ones that one can take from uh, what has happened at other universities. I was reading an article about the whole uh, adenovirus uh, you know, mini epidemic at the University of, of Maryland where there was loss of life. But they were also busy dealing, interestingly enough, with a severe mold problem mm -hmm. because of um, a lot of uh, humidity and moisture, because of rain, because of the ambient uh, conditions. Um, and these things can particularly show up in older uh, buildings. And so, so I, I, this is something that the way these things come together and when we have students come in here, of course, we, we'd like them to have their um, vaccines, vaccinations as much as possible. But we're in a, a moment where, you know, we're having this uh, uh, emergent measles outbreak. And, and Dr. Gale, you worked uh, with the Gates Foundation you know, which has made um, enormous contributions to vaccine delivery in poorer nations. But what are your thoughts about this current measles outbreak in the U.S.? And this, and 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 Dr. Mr. Barber, same question of, in terms of this perhaps reemergence of of diseases that we thought we had uh, beaten back. And 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 how does the pharmaceutical industry play into this or not? Well, I'll just say. Uh, uh, a couple things, you know, I think it feeds into what we were talking about earlier, which is a little bit of this anti-science environment that we have going on. And I think it, you know, has um, impacted people's belief in vaccine science. They're um, feeding into some of the myths about side effects of vaccine, that vaccines cause autism, which we, you know, have had study after study that shows that there is no causal uh, effect. Um, you know, people feel like their children may be walled off and somehow protected, not realizing that if they don't, they don't immunize their children, 
the her herd immunity goes down and therefore they're putting other people's children at risk. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there around um, vaccinations and it's shown up in these most recent measles outbreak. You know, and, and I think part of it is that people never, we're a generation of people who have never seen serious measles cases and don't realize the impact. And so we kind of have become complacent about how important it is to continue to vaccinate children. And there's a lot of anti-science, um, you know, mythology going on. I agree with everything Dr. Gale just said, and I would add in addition. There is a, an issue, a reputational issue, with the big pharma companies that I think is playing into this, and it's very, very disturbing for me. Um, that industry has demonstrated a unique ability to shoot itself in both feet simultaneously. <laughs> for the last 20 years over issues having to do with important drugs. I would cite, for example, obscene increases in drug prices, sudden shortages of critically important drugs for, for people who had illnesses that needed them, ginned up research that tended to suggest that uh, there was an efficacy to drugs when in fact there was little or no such efficacy. Um, failure, to, uh, failure to include all of the contraindications of a new drug, and that became important as those contraindications played out. Civil lawsuits, criminal lawsuits, all of this has really spoiled, and I'll, that's a very gentle word, spoiled the reputation of that industry. And I can understand, I don't agree with, but I can understand parents saying, well, why should I take their vaccines when they have all of these other issues that have proven to be detrimental or, or, or damaging or that, that were lies? Why should we do that? Um, and, and so I would just add that to what Dr. Gale said. And, and, and one last comment. The herd immunity for any one of these diseases that were thought to have been taken care of, cured by these, by these uh, vaccines, tends to be lost when fewer than 90% of people are vaccinated. Now, we're not there with measles yet, but left unattended that issue, we will get to 90% and we will lose herd immunity. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think, and I call on some of my bio friends here, you know, there is a question, it seems, about uh, virulence when viral diseases come back around again. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that's something that, that we need to think more about within this context of what you referred to as herd immunity. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Dr. I, Gale. Um, I, I would agree. Um, slightly different, I would also say, coming out of his comments, you know, I, I do think that this issue of um, remaking capitalism and corporate greed and how we think about these issues is particularly important. And, and, and on one hand, you know, you see businesses stepping up to the plate and really taking seriously environmental issues and other social issues. On the other hand, I think you do see some industries um, putting profit before people. And, you know, capitalism works best when it realizes that economic value can also produce social value. And I think, to your point, this is an example where that has become disconnected right. and where you have an industry that should be thinking about its social mission that somehow, I think, has in many cases lost its way. Well, you know, we have some uh, cities here in the capital region, Albany, Schenectady, Troy, and Plattsburgh, that have filed lawsuits uh, against the manufacturers and the distributors of OxyContin. So again, they're laying the opioid crisis at the right. feet of the, uh, you know, these companies, the pharmaceutical industry. Is, is that what's going to get at the root of it, or are there other things? we have to think about vis-a-vis -vis the opioid crisis. And then 
Dr. Holdren, you and I are going to go back to the global thing in a second, but please. Well, there's nothing like taking their profits away to get their attention. <laughs> um, last year, 2018, 55,000 Americans died from opioid overdoses. Now, just think about that number for a minute. If you divide it by 365, that's, I can't do the math in my head, it's 150 some people. Imagine if an airplane carrying 150 people crashed every, every single day of the year. We stopped appropriately the 737 MAX from flying after two tragic accidents. Imagine if one happened every single day. And I'm told by the doctors at, at, at our place who work with this issue that that number is only going to grow and grow and grow. So the legal question, since I'm an attorney, for, for those, uh, those lawsuits, in my mind, becomes, did the manufacturers know how viciously addictive their drugs were and withhold that information as they were trying to push and increase sales of their product to the providers who were going to be administering them. If they knew, then there is liability clearly. And you know, the, the, the analog, I guess, would be to the tobacco cases, right? Which most of which got settled a decade or more ago. So we'll see. We'll see where those lawsuits are going to go. I suspect that there is a cause of action there, a credible cause of action. The one warning I, I would suggest, uh, and this comes from the experience with the tobacco cases, the state's attorneys general brought all of that money into the states. And if all of us remember, that money was to uh, go to education and, and prevention and, and all of the appropriate things with respect to tobacco use. And, and some of it did go there. But even in this state, and I know in most others, most of that money got taken away by the politicians and used for other purposes. I'm not saying we should not do the opioid lawsuit, lawsuits for that reason. We should do them. But I'm just saying, this time, let's have learned the lesson. And if that money comes in, let's use it appropriately to stop this kind of abuse. Yeah. Well, I think we have an exacerbation of the problem in the sense that uh, folks can go on the web and order mm -hmm. fentanyl and fentanyl-laced and synthetic fentanyl, mm -hmm. and it can come from any place. And so I think it, there's a deeper underlying issue having to do with, uh, let's call them uh, public health epidemics of many kinds. And, and, and the final one I want to ask about is gun violence. Uh, and of course, Chicago always has been in the news, but Chicago is not alone. But, and, and there are many levels to gun violence. One has to do with what happens in neighborhoods. The other is, of course, the lone wolf who comes and uh, shoots up many people. How do we get at the root of this? Yeah, well, you know, first and foremost, I think we have to accept that we have a real problem. And I don't know that uh, um, universally that has been acknowledged. Uh, but, you know, there, there, first of all, there are a lot of roots to gun violence, and as you mentioned, there are different types. And I think, you know, when we look at gun violence, we think of it as a public health issue. It's, it, it, is, it, is an issue it is a public safety issue, but it is clearly a public health issue. It is a, a huge cause of death, and it's a particularly huge cause of death of, of young people. Um, and so we have to think about what are the ways in which you attack any epidemic. Uh, you have to, first of all, recognize it, identify it, target which populations are most at risk, and then think about what are the ways to interrupt that transmission. And so in the short run, um, a lot of the work around violence prevention and, and gun violence is really going to the site and looking at how do you de-escalate situations that may end up as uh, violent acts and working with groups and, and, and people who can do outreach in communities to make sure that you can try to um, mitigate action at the source. But more importantly, if you think about the root causes, it's not that different in some ways from the opioid crisis. A lot of it is because we have an epidemic of despair in this country. Um, you know, it, the root causes, particularly as we see it in, in um, urban areas, 
stems again from the economic inequity that people have. When you have people who are hopeless and don't have opportunities to get a, a job, um, you know, they get involved with gang activities, drugs, and other things that lead to further violence. When we talk to young men who are killing each other in the streets, they will say, you know, if I had a job, I wouldn't be involved in, in gang warfare. And so, you know, we have to think about, are we give, at the root cause, are we looking at the issues that give people this sense of despair, just like, you know, while there's lots of factors to the opioid epidemic, you know, despair, hopelessness is a huge part of it. So I think you've got to attack both, you know, how do you stop the bleeding in, in an immediate sense, but then how do you look at the root causes that are, you know, at the source of this? And when you look at a lot of the lone wolf um, acts, a lot of this is around despair. It's also around unmet mental health needs, another big issue that we don't face squarely here in this country. Well, speaking about roots of despair, <laughs> uh -oh. Dr. Holden, unless you and I talk a little bit about, uh, about nuclear. Dr. Gloom. <laughs> no, no. Uh, this is an important conversation. And, and it's, it's not as lighthearted a one as some we've had in the past, but I think it is very important. And uh, so, Dr. Holden, you and I have worked on uh, nuclear nonproliferation issues in, in differing roles, and you four substantially long time, but as chairman of the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you know, I was part of the effort because of when I was chairman, it was not long after the breakup of the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. It was part of the effort to secure uh, poorly controlled nuclear materials across the newly independent states, uh, uh, <coughs> those former states of the Soviet Union, by in fact blending down weapons grade uh, HEU, highly enriched uranium, to actually create fuel that, to be burned right. in commercial nuclear reactors. And the role of the NRC would be to license the process by which that would be done, the facilities and the actual fuel fabrication. And of course, it's direct use in, the, um, in those re commercial reactors. But also, we work to help the newly independent states expose and uh, remediate the greatest uh, vulnerabilities of their uh, inherited Soviet era nuclear plants, including the so called um, RBMK reactors of mm -hmm. the type that blew up in the Chernobyl uh, accident. But you've worked very broadly on this question of, um, you know, weapons uh, you know, re reduction, nuclear weapons control. And so, how do you view the U.S. withdrawal? What are the, what's the impact from the, of our withdrawal from the Iran nuclear agreement, and as well as the threats posed as you see them by North Korea, uh, Pakistan, or the conflicts with India, et cetera? Well, that's another. Uh, I give you the trivial. Very, <laughs> very, very, very juicy <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, there are no easy questions being provided here. Uh, I think, uh, like the Affordable Care Act, the Iran nuclear agreement was not perfect, but it was a big step forward. And it was much better than any alternative uh, that could even have been described at the time uh, in terms of uh, cutting back uh, the options that Iran had to produce a nuclear weapon quickly and imposing uh, restrictions, actually some of them permanent, contrary to widespread belief, uh, some of them permanent on what Iran could do as long as they stayed in the agreement. And I think it's uh, diagnostic that all of the other parties to that agreement, which was not just the United States and Iran, but in, it included Russia and the major European countries, um, all of partners have stayed in while the United States got out in hopes of being able to maintain uh, this agreement to uh, greatly reduce the chance that Iran would acquire nuclear weapons anytime soon. Uh, with respect to Pakistan and India, that is a very volatile situation. It's one that if uh, somebody came down from another planet and looked at what was going on there, they'd think that the inhabitants of Earth must be absolutely insane to threaten 
each other with nuclear weapons over the, the rather modest and, and relatively easily remediable differences between India and Pakistan. I mean, there are historical resentments and hatreds there, but the notion that these would justify the incineration of enormous populations is just basically crazy. Uh, and by the way, uh, we in the United States and the former Soviet Union indulged in similar uh, absolutely crazy propositions, uh, mutual assured destruction, and the fact that the differences between the United States and the Soviet Union would justify the incineration of tens or hundreds of millions of people, I think is basically nuts. And any objective observer who just came upon this from some other world would declare it nuts. Uh, North Korea uh, is, I find, inscrutable. Uh, I have no idea what uh, Chairman Kim is uh, likely to do. Uh, but I have no idea what my own government is likely to do <laughs> in, the, uh, in the domain of responses to the North Korean situation, responses to the Iranian situation. Uh, I do think, uh, and I think uh, you probably know this already, I think that we need nuclear energy to have a positive future. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need the contribution of nuclear energy to a carbon-free energy system. The world today remains more than 80% dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas for its energy using technologies that put all of the combustion product carbon dioxide into the atmosphere driving climate change. The United States is 85% dependent. Even our electricity sector, where nuclear makes its biggest contribution, about 20% of US electricity, two thirds of our electricity still comes from fossil fuels. It is conceivable that we can get our arms around the climate challenge without an expanded contribution from nuclear energy, but it would be far easier and thus far more likely if we could expand nuclear energy in the world, not just in the United States. But doing that requires addressing basically four challenges. We have to make nuclear energy less expensive, while we're doing it, we have to make it safer because if we have 10 or 50 times as much, the reactors have to be significantly safer than the average today, although the best of today, uh, today's reactors are uh, probably uh, sufficiently safe even for a 10-fold or 20-fold expansion. We have to figure out how to manage the radioactive waste in a way that satisfies not only the technical community but the public that this solution is satisfactory. And we have to, insofar as possible, break the link between nuclear energy technology and nuclear weapons technologies. I happen to think every one of those problems is soluble and that we should be working very hard on solving them because we do need that contribution. But whether we will, in fact, be wise enough to solve them all, I'm not so sure. And I worry about it. Well, you know, my role here is never to offer an opinion. <laughs> But go ahead. <laughs> no, this will be more of an observation from my time as uh, chair of the NRC. And that is that uh, there is a distinct linkage uh, in many uh, nations' governments, governments uh, between their desire for nuclear power programs and their desire to have ability, ability. Mm -hmm to create nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And solving the quote unquote back end of the fuel cycle, if we're going to stick with fission based, uranium based reactors, has got to be dealt with, which is Absolutely. in order to stay away from these questions yeah. about nuclear yeah. proliferation. So that's a statement. With which I agree. Great. So let me just ask you three final questions, to, one to each of you, and then we're going to open to the audience. And this is about you. So Dr. Holdren, uh, you had inspirations. Tell us about the inspirations for your career. Apparently, already in high school, you knew you wanted to work at the nexus of science and society. And you spent your career, quote unquote, speaking science to power. Uh, and you have a speaking style that uh, one is blunt. Some might say in politic. Um, but when we were on PCAST, uh, Dr. Holdren used to always say, well, and so this is what we seem like we're going to do. He says, are there, and my cabinet has heard this from me, 
you know, it's everybody upset or their cries of outrage. But that was always a good move to make, I think. So if you feel you've spoken science to power, uh, how did you succeed in the White House and in your various government roles? Well, there were a bunch of questions there. One, how did uh, I get you know inspired? That I always ask you and, and, and two, how did, I, how did I function in the White House? Um, let me just say I got inspired to work on these issues when I was a junior in high school, and I read two books. One, C.P. Snow's book, The Two Cultures, in which the two cultures referred to the culture of natural science and engineering uh, versus the culture of social science and humanities. And C.P. Snow argued that the most interesting and intractable problems facing human civilization were sitting in the gulf between these two cultures, that they could not be understood, never mind solved, without drawing on insights and capabilities from both cultures. And he argued that there were too few people trying to become proficient in at least the languages of the two cultures so as to be able to build bridges and address these complicated problems that require insights from both. The second book I read was a book by the geochemist Harrison Brown, uh, written in 1954, called The Challenge of Man's Future. You have to remember it was 54, so they could say man's future. Exactly. He would title it differently today. But it was a book that was about the intersection of problems of population, resources, energy, international security, education. And he argued that none of those challenges could be surmounted unless we surmounted them all. That we had to deal with education, with resources, with energy, with population, with technology uh, in, in an integrated way. And it made me think that what I wanted to work on was these great problems of the human condition and how science and technology can be brought to bear on them, but with understanding of the human dimensions and the dimensions that require the humanities and the social sciences to bring in. In the, in the White House, the way I functioned in the White House, and I tell my students in courses I teach about speaking science to power, that the most important thing is to be true to the science, that you cannot shade your scientific opinion according to political preference, or according to what your boss would like to hear. If your boss cannot stand to listen to your best assessment of the scientific and technological realities that bear on the policy problem at hand, then you probably need to get out of there. Uh, I succeeded in the White House because I had the greatest possible boss. Uh, President Obama was incredibly savvy about science, technology, and innovation. He wanted to see science and technology and innovation used in order to advance the most important priorities of the nation, the economic priorities, the public health priorities, the environmental priorities, the national and homeland security priorities. He was open to ideas about how to do it. He was discerning, as you well know from your interactions with him in PCAST, he was discerning in being able to discriminate between a good idea and a bad idea in these domains. And uh, I would say he always had my back. There were times when other people in the White House suggested that I had been too frank uh, or too blunt about some issue that had political sensitivities around it. It was occasionally suggested by some that I should be sacked. Uh, and President Obama's answer to that was always the following. He said, Holdren just told the truth. He's my science advisor. That's his job. Uh, that basically being true to the facts as you understand them is absolutely essential. The other thing that is essential in, uh, in speaking truth to power is that you don't abuse the attention of your principal. You don't rush to the boss with every uh, possible matter where you could possibly use the boss's help. You resolve every problem that you can at your level before you go up a level. You respect the time and attention of the boss because that's usually the scarcest resource. Uh, and you don't complain to the boss about what other people who work for him are doing or not doing. Uh, those principles will go a long way. The last principle that I tell people uh, who are interested in doing this kind of thing is you get a lot more done if you don't care who gets the credit. Mm -hmm. exactly.
Dr. Gale, then you have said that as a child, you thought that you would, and I quote, liberate all oppressed peoples <laughs> everywhere. So tell us where this sense of empathy for all of humanity came from, as well as the outsized confidence you had that you could fix the most intractable of problems. Well, um, first of all, I grew up in the 60s, so that was the lingo of the day. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you <know>? um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I feel really fortunate um, that I, I, I grew up in a family where um, excellence, academic excellence was you know, something that was expected. But it was also very much expected that we gave back to our community. And you know, we were kind of raised with that sense that to whom much was given, much was expected. Um, and so you know, we were all expected that we should use our education in a way that, that um, in some ways, in some way or the other, gave back. And so that was just very deeply ingrained in me as a, as a child. I also think that you know, growing up in the times that I grew up made a big difference. You know, I grew up in the times when we had the civil rights movement, women's movement, um, you know, anti-apartheid, anti-Vietnam. I mean, you know, it was the movement generation. And I think for me, I early on I got this sense of wanting to be some part of something bigger than myself, and you know, saw social change happening at grand scale. And so it gave me the sense that it is possible to make a difference. And you know, I, I went into health because I thought that was a very practical tool. Um, people's health matters. It's core to your ability to hold a job, your ability to have a family, have good life outcomes. But I did start realizing, you know, I trained as a pediatrician, and you know, realizing that I could do uh, a lot for individuals one at a time, but public health gave me the opportunity to really have uh, my patient not only be an individual, but my patient could be a community or a nation or the world. And so, you know, I felt that if I wanted to have a big impact um, beyond what I could do person by person, then working at the population level um, gave me that ability. So I, I, I guess, you know, it, I, you know, social change was what uh, is kind of in my DNA, and I've just tried to, as I've gone along in my career, think about continuing to think about what's underneath this, what's the root cause of the problem that I'm trying to address. And you know, you can treat the symptoms, and that's fine. You put people out of um, suffering and, and misery, but if you look at what are the root causes of a problem, then you can actually change something in a sustainable way. And so that's what I've tried to do. And Mr. Barber, you know, how does a very successful lawyer with a very comfortable life as senior counsel at a law firm end up running an academic medical center with all of the complexities and headaches? Uh, you know, you grew up on Dove Street here in Albany, and you've often expressed your love for your native uh, city. I mean, so how did all of this come together? you know, for you uh, at a moment to do what you did? By accident. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, for, for me, with, with this position, I was either in the right place at the right time or I was in the wrong place at the right time. Um, I had uh, I'd become involved at the Albany Medical College uh, 40 years ago in 1979. Uh, I'd done some volunteer work before then. In 79, I was asked to become a member of the board. Long story short, I worked my way through, uh, and in 94, became chairman of the board of the entire medical center. Um, immediately after that happened, we lost two CEOs in eight months. And we were in desperate financial conditions. As a matter of fact, the day that I was nominated to become board chair, the CFO told me, it was a Thursday, I'll never forget it, the CFO told me we did not have enough cash to make payroll the next day. Uh, and he also suggested that the petition for bankruptcy had been drawn up and I should authorize its being filed. Um, I refused to do that. Uh, we managed to find some cash by making some quick phone calls to insurers and banks. Um, and, and then we went on. So w when I lost the second CEO, the board said to me, look, 
it's, it's you or nobody. We don't know how to attract anybody else. <laughs> so so, so let, me, let, me just, let me just play off something that Dr. Gale said because it resonated so with me, I too being the child of the 60s. In, in my whole life, and this is true, no one ever suggested that failure was an option. And so I just believed that if you worked hard enough and surrounded yourself with the right people uh, and got a little bit of luck to break your way, you could solve just about anything you put your mind to. Absolutely. And that's exactly how I approach this. With, with the love and support of my wife and my daughter, um, I went right at it. Uh, and we didn't fix the problems overnight. We didn't even fix them in the first five years. But 24 years later, I think it's a rather remarkable organization. And I did that because so many people ultimately believed what I believed and became members of my team that we would not fail if we were in it together. So we'll take a few moments for a, a few questions if any of you in the audience would like to ask uh, our honorands a question, if we could bring up the lights so that uh, uh, we can see. You can go to the microphones in the aisles, please. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Bystroff. I teach a population course here at RPI. Um, I have, uh, I've been thinking uh, lately about why uh, white people like me uh, don't speak out more against racism, because if we did, there'd be an advantage that we're, it's not likely to appear self-serving, whereas if you're a person of color and you speak out against racism, uh, it's gonna have the wrong optics. It's gonna feel uh, more self-serving. So, but I, I don't wanna ask that question. I don't wanna put you on that spot. What I do wanna ask is a scientific question. And it goes, it, suppose you have a mammalian species growing exponentially, reaching its resource limits, and this species has divisions within it. Don't those divisions favor the majority? And what happens when the, reaching the resource limits, the aggressions between the subpopulations, what happens, how does that affect their ability to deal with problems that affect all of them, such as climate change? And I'm directing this to the expert in society and uh, global ecology. Hey, Dr. Holdren. Thank you very much, I think. Uh, <laughs> that, that is a tough one. There, there is, of course, a, a fair amount of literature about uh, resource conflicts, of, uh, of struggling over limited access to resources of various kinds, uh, land, water, oil, uh, agricultural productivity. Uh, we have been engaged for a long time in uh, what I would characterize as a race, a race between the rising demands of a human population that is not just larger, but increasingly consumptive of material resources uh, on the one hand, and advances in technology on the other hand that have uh, enabled us to increase our ability to mobilize resources to convert them into the goods and services that people want and to provide them. Uh, at the same time, if you take stock, you have to note that we haven't done all that well because well over a billion people, something approaching two billion, are still desperately poor in this world. Uh, even tens of millions in the United States uh, and far larger numbers elsewhere. And so when the technological cornucopians say that technology will always come to the rescue and we can support any population at any level of living as long as we're clever enough, I have to say we are uh, uh, in some sense not even winning the race uh, in any comprehensive way at today's level of population and consumption because so many people are left out. Uh, and considering where we're starting, uh, namely behind, uh, both with respect to the people left out and with respect to the technologies we are using being in many respects unsustainable, uh, as the climate change issue indicates, uh, we should be a little more reflective as to whether unlimited population growth and unlimited material consumption growth 
can uh, persist indefinitely, which is one of the assumptions that seems to underlie conventional economics, uh, that, that nothing ever has to stop growing. Well, in a finite space, material things do ultimately have to stop growing, and we, uh, we have a challenge there that we have been reluctant as a society to face. And that's probably enough on that point for now. Venture prediction. I'm going to go to the next, please. Uh, hello. I've uh, lived in 18 countries. I was a son of a diplomat, and I was in the military during the 80s. I was a cold warrior, um, and I've had a lot of different perspectives and luck in my life. I'm also an Ivy League graduate, and thank you for changing to my school's colors, Yale, in my honor. Thank you. But uh, from the red of the Rensselaer in your backdrop. <laughs> but um, this is a visioneering question to con to, to, for the panel to consider, and that's that really the way forward, I think, for the human race is that for institutions of science such as Rensselaer to lead the way in the digitization of the human intellect and the human persona, so then we can go to the exoplanets because we can then survive the light years journeys that it would take to reach there. And you could like marry Alexa, you will be, um, you know, you will be sustainable as long as there's power to sustain the systems, and you might even get beyond that as we get clever enough um, with our science. But that's really the way to do it, and it should be an elite thing, in my view, where only the great minds get to do the journey. No, I think we should make a hundred, you know, replicas of the entire human race and send them to a, a hundred exoskeletons and keep a copy here, not exoskeletons, sorry, exoplanets. And, uh, and still keep a copy here and lead all the lives that you want, but in a digital format that is not as so consumptive. A lot of the things that a lot of the panel members uh, were expressing, unfortunately, I could not agree with. Like I was recently in Nepal where they burn bodies, they burn everything, and the air pollution is terrible. And there, you know, I, I couldn't, I had trouble going outside in Kathmandu. And if you go to uh, Everest, you know, it's heaped with, you know, trash. You know, it seems to be the Sherpas only get paid to carry things uphill. No one's paying them to bring things downhill. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I, I don't know about this wealth transfer to other people. I think we should try to rise everybody up and uh, not try to uh, limit uh, others. I think that the capacity for humankind to meet challenges and face them sure. boldly is what we need to encourage. Okay, so I think that's a statement as opposed to a question. But, but I think that's what the panel's been, in fact, discussing. Please. Yeah, thank you for a very stimulating discussion and let us be part of it. You all provided a different lenses into this very interconnected, um, challenging social ecological systems that we live in and act, act on. It strikes me in, in listening to the conversation that the challenges uh, that we face are not that we don't understand the drivers and the consequences of action or inaction. Indeed, you explained many of them. The challenge is also not that uh, we don't know what the solutions um, can be for them. It seems that people experience these problems in a place-based way, but the challenges that you've explained are national or global, and that itself is, 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 is um, difficult for people to, to act on and figure out what to do. So I, I was wanted to ask the panel, from your different lenses about these <coughs> problems and these systems as you described, what do you think as leaders or other, other leaders like yourselves in the community, what should they act on and how, and how should they do this to really make this change? Because clearly we know what the changes need to be and we know what some of the solutions are but figuring out where is that nexus, where is that pressure point that we should be dialing in to actually make that change, where is that? Where is that at the leadership level for communities like yourselves? And where is it for all these bright young minds that are ready to go out in the world and want to make a change? And figuring out where do I start? Like how do I make a change because I want to make it? Dr. Gale, you want to? Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, I, I, first, there, there's lots of questions in what you asked. You know, I think everybody has to figure out for themselves um, what they think they can contribute to any given problem. And, you know, a lot of that is based on, you know, your own sense of what your purpose is, et cetera. And so I think on an individual level, you know, people have to decide for themselves. But I think that, you know, individuals, at the end of the day, individuals make up communities, communities make up um, 
states, states make up nations, nations make up the globe. And I think each of us have an opportunity to have an impact on whatever ecosystem you end up being in. And I think it all, you know, being able to um, affect the next level is what all of us can do. Um, at the end of the day, it, you're right, we experience things in our own environment, but if we're not using our voice, if we're not using our knowledge, if we're not using our influence in somehow to impact the, the system that's, you know, ne the next system up, um, then we're not going to have that, that impact. But there are lots of different ways, I think, to have an impact on that. You know, we talked a lot about global governance and how important it is that we have these systems that can act um, on, the, you know, on the behalf of all of our best interests. So I think we have to you know, be a voice for having credible systems, um, be willing to use our voice to speak truth to power as, as we've talked about. You know, and I think there's so many different ways to answer that, but at the end of the day, each of us needs to feel like we have a responsibility and a stake in using what we have to hold others accountable to make decisions that are in our best interest. I would just add to that very quickly, and I agree with everything uh, that Dr. Gale said, but I, I think one can say that the solutions have to be top down, bottom up, and middle out, exactly. all three. Uh, and that, that, as Dr. Gale has said, uh, all of us can find different places to intersect with that process, either the bottom up part, the top down part, the middle out part. Uh, I also think we are going to see in the presidential campaign in the United States to come a lot of these opportunities and choices laid out uh, by the different candidates on what we need to change to make a difference on these big challenges. And I would just, sorry, to, just to double back, I mean, I, I do think that point of civic responsibility is so important. You know, in this country, our rates of voting are abysmal. And then we look up and say, you know, um, you know, why do we have the situation that, that we may be dissatisfied with today? So I think we've got to realize that we have a real responsibility, and part of that is, is making our voices heard when we have the opportunity to pe put people in leadership roles. And I think if we don't, then we get what we um, put into it. Dr. Mr. Barba. Let me speak, and I agree with everything that's been said, let me, let me speak in favor of bottom-up solutions. As I said in my very last comments, I've always believed in the power of the individual to turn serious issues towards solutions. Um, as crazy as that may sound, uh, I believe it. And what we need to do today, what we've always needed to do, is to have someone like you, who may have a position, let's say, on my issue on health care, come together with other people of similar positions and decide what you're going to do about it. During my comments, I cited a number of reports. Um, let me cite one that I wrote myself in 2002 where I tried to take on the issue of why the healthcare system was not a system. I tried to conclude by suggesting that the only way we could solve it is by having a national debate. Well, it's now 17 years later. I may be 17 years wiser. What I understand is politics always gets in the way of this stuff. So not only do you have to come together with people of similar opinions, but you have to kick the politicians out of the way. And if you can't do that, you have to have them understand that you're serious and their job is threatened by that very solemn attitude that you're adopting if they don't start listening to you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask you to be succinct. <laughs> I'll try to be succinct. Um, so I have a question about uh, electronic health records and data, and I think it can more broadly relate to data. So I'm a PhD student, and um, in my career, I would like to be able to take advantage of some of these really large data sets that are becoming more and more available. But as you guys alluded to, um, right now, public or 
Electronic health records are largely decentralized, and so recent efforts have started to try to bring them into a more kind of centralized uh, zone, I guess. Um, but when I think of centralizing things like personal health records in the private sector with like a company like Amazon, I also worry that there might be downsides to that kind of centralization, especially given the fact that, you know, it is a for-profit company and um, would there be some sort of government oversight for that kind of thing? So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on centralization of public or health data, data in general, and whether or not there should be oversights in this. <laughs> well, one could almost argue the train has left the station. Yeah. <laughs> because with the information that people put out about themselves online, you'd be amazed with behavioral analytics, how much can be gleaned about your health without your health record. But uh, Dr. Holdren. Well, the question of vulnerability is, is very real. I, I was one of 23 million identities stolen from the Office of Personnel Management so in the US <laughs> federal government. <laughs> President Jackson's identity was also stolen, uh, and, and I, had some serious consequences from that, uh, which I will not detail here, but it was a very unpleasant experience. Uh, and this points to the fact that government oversight is not in itself necessarily a remedy. This was a government database with 23 million identities in it, uh, which were stolen. So these are enormously challenging questions that you're posing. There's tremendous potential uh, in the data that you're talking about, tremendous potential to improve uh, therapies to improve prevention strategies, to improve health outcomes, but there's also uh, real peril in uh, making all these data, first of all, electronically compatible. Right now they're on different systems. They're not even, uh, they can't even intercommunicate. Uh, if we fix all that, it's absolutely essential that we fix it in a way that all this personal health information does not become available through misstep or misdeed. We have to put the individual more in charge of their own mm -hmm. data. Let me go here, please. Good afternoon. I'm a lecturer in recent graduates from the School of Management. I come originally from Mexico, and I, there's a problem I'm deeply concerned about. You talk about uh, local solutions to global problems. Uh, transnational criminal organizations, uh, it's a big problem. Um, they bring illegal drugs to the U.S., and then they flow uh, money and weapons back to Mexico and other Latin American countries, and that contributes to the violence and the disintegration of the social fabric. Um, nobody seems to be integrating the different phases of this problem. I would like to know uh, your thoughts about it. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I mean, my, my thoughts is they should be integrated. You know, so I, obviously it's a huge problem, and you know that particular problem, you know, has multiple facets. There's drug in the drug trade. Uh, there's the gangs that are forming. There's you know the, the um, cross border and cross national issues. You know, it's a huge problem. I think it's one that clearly needs to have a much more integrated approach. I don't, I don't, you know, if there was a simple answer, it would have been solved. But I think you, you raise a good, uh, it's another one of these examples of a very interconnected problem that we don't really have the systems yet in place and, and the kind of governance that really works for these very integrated sort of problems. And I think it's one of the things that I think all of us have, have kind of highlighted in one way or the other is that we really have to, as we think about these problems that are so interconnected, um, where we have systems that are still very siloed and we think about problems in you know, kind of this very siloed nature, we're not gonna be able to come up with the kind of solutions for the complex problems that are facing our world today. That's just a good example of that. So there's a systems issue and we've talked about that. But a lot of what, the, the root of what you're talking about is a governance issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having to do with uh, what governments choose to do in terms of sharing sensitive information. And of course, then what governments choose to do if they have uh, how they choose to act on certain information. But we're also at a moment when there's a, uh, a move 
increasingly to localize data, to, to put uh, somehow sovereign borders around data. And if the data is not, uh, you know, the, the governance structure has to, to help with decisions about, uh, well, first to get agreement on what the problems are that uh, one wishes to solve. And then what is the governance structure in terms of what data and how to do that. And then what the relative responses of nations will be. And, and so it's, these things are very uh, interconnected problems. And so it's not uh, so straightforward. What one typically ends up finding out is that even without, in the absence of, of sophisticated information systems, uh, there's data that can be acted upon in a pretty simple and straightforward way. But if the uh, agreement and the governance and the political will is not there to do it, uh, it's not going to happen anyway. I but have one you. sentence to add. A wall is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello, thank you for your time. Uh, I had a question about nuclear energy and trying to expand its role in our energy sector. Um, as far as I can tell, ever since we've started using nuclear energy, any big incident like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, or Fukushima will always decrease public support for nuclear energy. Is there a, a strategy to push policy that can remediate some concerns that the public has about nuclear reactors and nuclear energy? that you see being effective going into the future? Sure. He can start uh, off uh, with my perspective. <laughs> no, I think the strategy is to make nuclear reactors less expensive at the same time that we make them safer, to put forward a scheme for radioactive waste management, which I think is technically a rather a straightforward problem, uh, and break the link with nuclear weapon proliferation by depending only on reactor fuel cycles that never separate plutonium and that never involve the use of highly enriched uranium. Uh, there are a few other little tricks that probably need to be done, such as centralized uh, uranium enrichment facilities so that individual countries cannot use such facilities to make highly enriched uranium for weapons. I think all these problems are soluble and they are all explainable, but it will take a very substantial effort and right now, that effort is inadequate, uh, in my judgment. In my judgment, our entire investment in advanced energy technologies is a quarter of what it ought to be to put us in position to address adequately the climate change challenge. And the insufficiency of resources being devoted to making nuclear energy an expandable and publicly acceptable solution or contribution to a solution is only a part of that problem of inadequate effort on developing and deploying the advanced technologies that the world needs. The, the most difficult problem during my tenure as chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which persists to this day, uh, is this question, if we stay in the frame of the kind of nuclear reactors we have, even with ones that are more passively safe, and there are designs like that, is, is this question of the back end of the fuel cycle. We still have uh, spent fuel uh, that has not been disposed of for every reactor that's ever run uh, in this country. So, so that's number one. Number two, uh, the reactor designs, for the most part, date back to the earliest designs. Uh, coming out of uh, the days of even the Atomic Energy Commission. And so there's not been this investment in the, the newer technologies and safer technologies. And then the third is a question of, you know, we had a discussion earlier about in, in the question uh, relative to vaccination and, and the questions about public understanding. And, and you mentioned three different nuclear accidents which all had they're really very different. The only one that was a, a nuclear criticality accident was Three Mile Island. And it didn't propagate that far in terms of what happened, but it was a criticality event. Whereas the uh, Chernobyl 
was a steam explosion, and Fukushima was a loss of power and some hydrogen explosions because of water supply disappearing. But, and, 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 and it basically had its root, as you know, in an earthquake and a tsunami and, and the loss of off-site power and backup on-site power. And so, but again, it was not a, uh, even though you had some destruction of the reactor core, it was not a nuclear criticality accident. So, so, so this question of improving public understanding about nuclear and, and the vulnerabilities and how you, you manage and mitigate those, this question of investment in newer technologies, and the question of closing the back end of the old fuel cycle, much less what you do in the future. These are things that have to be addressed. In addition, because we have not built nuclear reactors here, with a couple of exceptions, for a very long time, we have no real ability in this country to build them. And so where they are being built, and they've been built at very high cost, it's not being done by U.S. companies. Thank you. Please. Hey, how you guys doing? Um, my next question is for Dr. Gell. Earlier, you spoke of vaccination. Um, my research, actually, well, it's not as research, but from what I found from different people, one of the things that create opposition is the thing of mercury, which destabilized the new one in the brain stems. Is there a grand sort of equalizer that can bring everything into a great alignment from the public relation in the big pharma? So kind of give, we establish trust when it comes to vaccination as far in the long term. Yeah, I, you know, <clears throat> I guess just to kind of go back to some of the things I would said earlier, you know, I think that there's um, been a lot of disinformation around vaccination, including around um, products used for stabilization. And I think there needs to be more positive information. You know, and I think some of it, there's, there's two different populations, if you will, uh, or two different categories of people who have mistrust. Some because um, they may be people who have you know, kind of the luxury of feeling like they don't, you know, they're, they don't necessarily need to worry about their children and they live in somewhat of a privileged world and, you know, think that they can kind of wall their, their children off from any adversity. There's another category of people who um, distrust vaccination because they have a distrust of medicine, health, and, and health uh, the health industry for some of it for good historic reasons because there hasn't always been um, good trusting relationships between health industry and particularly vulnerable populations in, in this country and around the world. And so I think there are different ways in which we need to repair that trust so that people actually have the right information and also trust the health system. And as Mr. Barbara said, trust the pharmaceutical industries that in some ways, you know, also has seeded some of this mistrust. So I think some of it is information, but it's also how do we build trust? How do we build that sense of accountability? And when you've had breaches of trust, um, you, you understand why people then don't trust uh, something like vaccination as well as other medical interventions. Okay. So I'm gonna ask the last two to each ask your question and then we'll see if we can give an omnibus answer because we've run <laughs> yeah. out of time. Please. Uh, hello there. I'm a senior for the next 20 hours. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so like many people probably in this room, uh, <laughs> we came here really excited to change the world and we want to do science and engineering and you know, like e-arts, whatever you want to do, to help people. I think most people want to help others. But um, you know, looking for jobs around this time period, at least for a mechanical engineer, a lot of it is very corporate, which is OK. but for somebody who wants to go into nonprofit and help the communities they're part of, I guess the best of advice professors keep give, giving me is make a startup, but you know, <laughs> not everyone can just, I can't just do that, you know, at least not right now. But um, I guess, how else would you, I guess what advice would you guys have for somebody, I guess, oh, sorry. A lot of other engineers I talked to during my internship, they're all just, they don't have any passion for it anymore. So I guess, what do you guys do to keep 
um, keep passionate about your subject, even in um, times where there's a lot of setbacks? And um, how do you, I guess, how did you get to the point where you were able to see the impact you made, if that makes sense? That's, that's a good question. Let me, I'm let me hear this yeah. individual first. Yeah, my apologies. My question is completely unrelated to his. It's okay. That's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll work but out. anyway, I've been reading recently about the about research in Europe and China into fusion reactors, and I know fusion has always been like the energy source that's always 20 years away. But I was wondering if any if any members of the board have thought about any implications of implementing fusion power on society, both short term, like if there would be any power disparities between the countries that develop fusion first and the countries that get it later on in the cycle, or long term societal benefits once fusion finally proliferates to the general global populace. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to ask Dr. Holdren to give a 30 second, which is hard, uh, oh, answer <laughs> to your fusion question. And then we're gonna close out with each one of them giving a succinct answer to your question. Okay, I, I spent a fair amount of my, uh, the early part of my career working on fusion. It has been called uh, the energy source of the future and always will be. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it is possible that we will ultimately succeed as a society in harnessing fusion. Uh, when we do, it will be an important addition to the menu of energy options for the long term. It will not be a silver bullet. Uh, the uh, holy grail dimension of fusion, which was often advertised in its early years, uh, has disappeared. Uh, it is effectively inexhaustible, but like everything else, there is no free lunch. It is not going to be cheap. It is not going to be entirely free of uh, safety and environmental hazards. Those will have to be managed. It is not going to transform global civilization. What motivates you, what keeps you going? I, I love the question. Um, I faced exactly the same dilemma when I graduated from law school. I went to law school for all the right reasons as far as I'm concerned. I was going to change the world and really fix it up good. Well, that didn't happen. But here's what I could do. I, worked, I, was, I practiced corporate law, and I was good at it. I worked hard. My clients benefited from my, my services, and I took their money. And I turned around and invested what I could in not-for-profits in my community. Not only just the money, but ultimately, you heard me say, my own energy, my own talents, and eventually became completely absorbed in the not-for-profit world. That's one pathway. It's one that worked for me. I'd suggest it might work for you. Dr. Gale. Yeah, I guess mine would be somewhat similar, although I took a path where the core of what I did was about uh, my social passion. But you know, I think people can construct a life of meaning in so many different ways. You went into engineering because you probably found it fascinating and intellectually challenging. That's important. We all want to continue to have things that stimulate us and give us a sense of uh, excitement and, and fulfill our curiosity. So don't give up on that. But think of other ways that you can use those skills or use other skills that you develop along the way to give back. And you can do volunteer work. or you, you know, There are lots of other ways that you can do it. But don't give up on the thing that brought you here. Um, there are lots of ways that you, as an engineer or wherever, you, whatever path you take, can always use that in ways that give back. And you can also, you know, there is always other ways, you know, through community organizations, nonprofits, others, that you can also continue to fulfill that, that sense of purpose and passion. Can I offer one quote from Winston Churchill, which I love in this connection? <laughs> Churchill said, a pessimist sees the difficulties in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunities in every difficulty. Um, to succeed, you need to look for the opportunities. They are there. If you think about what you would most like to do and seek a way to enable that, you will succeed. You will find the opportunities in spite of the difficulties.
So we've been very privileged to have Mr. James Barber, the president and CEO of the Albany Medical Center, uh, Dr. Helene Gale, the president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, and Dr. John Holdren, I should say the honorable uh, John Holdren, uh, former science advisor to uh, President Barack Obama and uh, head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy at the uh, Kennedy School of Government and the Professor of uh, Environmental Don't Science at Harvard. Again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little long, but it's important. And, and I think what you've really seen is uh, both examples and exemplars of uh, the health of the planet leadership in that regard at the, for local care and global impact. And I want to thank you for being so generous with your time and so open in your responses. They will receive honorary degrees from Rensselaer at tomorrow's commencement exercises. Let us thank them.